One of the comments I always get after I run any kind of test is this. Hey Richard, why don't you run the same test under boost? That made me think, does anything happen to the shape of the power curve when we do add boost? Let's find out. In this video, we're going to find out if adding boost actually changes the shape of the power curve. We're not going to just look at one combination, we're going to look at three. We're going to look at a turbo combination, a centrifugal blower combination, and a roots blower combination. We're going to check them all out and see what happens to the shape of the power curve when we add boost. Does it change where we make peak power? Does it change where we make peak torque? Does it change anything at all in the shape of the curve? Let's find out. To illustrate what happens to the power curve when you add boost to see if it changes where the motor makes peak power or peak torque, we set up three combinations. This first one is the turbo combination. We'll follow this up with a centrifugal blower and then a roots blower. But on the turbo combination, which I think is probably the, <laughs> the most ideal combination, what you want to happen on your turbo combination is if you set your wastegate at, let's say, 10 pounds, what you want to do is size the turbo relative to your motor and your desired power output so that the, mo the, the turbo comes up right away, hits 10 pounds, the wastegate controls that 10 pounds, it carries 10 pounds all the way out to the top of the RPM range. So if you have a consistent boost curve, what's going to happen to the shape of the power curve is it's going to remain exactly the same. The motor will make peak power at the same RPM. It will make peak torque at the same RPM. And that holds true if you have a consistent boost curve. Now, if you don't have a consistent boost curve, which we'll show in the centrifugal blower and, the, and even the positive displacement blower, it obviously changes the shape of the power curve. On this test, we ran it on a very mild uh, 5.2 three liter LM7. It had a trailblazer SS intake. It also had lower compression pistons, but it really doesn't matter what we run it on. The important thing is that if the boost is consistent, the shape of the curve stays exactly the same. Now, if we were to add a camshaft to this, if we were to add an intake manifold or ported heads or whatever we did to change the shape of the curve, whatever the shape of that new curve is, if we add 10 pounds everywhere to that curve, it stays exactly the same it's just higher. It just makes more power. And that's exactly what happened. As I said, this was a 5.3 liter LM7. The only thing we had on it was a set of 26 918 springs because we were label, later going to put a camshaft in it. We had inch and 7 eighths headers. We had a Holly management system. It had a Trailblazer SS intake manifold and run in that NA trim on pump gas. It made 353 horsepower. 378 foot-pounds of torque, and here's what happened after we installed our turbo. It was a single turbo with a Holley um, turbo manifold, single turbo. It was a uh, precision turbo, a 7675. And as you can see, even though we had a little bit less boost down low, the boost curve was fairly consistent. So the shapes of the curve, the shapes of the power curve, and the shapes of the torque curve, were essentially the same. And this is what turbos do if they're sized correctly. It doesn't add power. <laughs> it doesn't change. Well, it does add. It adds lots of, a lot of power, but it doesn't change the shape of the curve. It doesn't change where the motor makes peak power or where it makes peak torque. It's just the same curve, only elevated all the way up. And that's what happens when we install a turbo, and it works very well. Now, the other thing you can do with this, if you have an electronic controller and you have it controlled based on gearing or time or especially RPM and you can change the boost curve, then you can change the shape of this curve. And we'll take a close look at what happens when we have a rising boost curve on both the centrifugal application and the roots application. So let's check it out. As we saw in the first example with the turbo, if we have a consistent boost curve, which we want to happen with a turbo, we want it to come up, we want the wastegate to control it and can contr control it at a consistent amount all the way through the curve. If we have that consistent boost curve, basically the power curve of a turbo application just mirrors the power curve of the NA application. It's just the NA curve only elevated <laughs> at a much higher level. So it just makes a lot more power, but the shape is the same. It makes peak power at the same RPM and peak torque at the same RPM as long as the boost is consistent. But what happens when the boost curve is not consistent? So let's take a look at an example where the boost curve is not consistent. And the best example of that, I think, is a centrifugal supercharger because it has a rising boost curve. So it has a lot less boost down low where we start the run than it does at the power peak. 
or actually at the peak RPM, because what happens is with a centrifugal blower, it keeps making boost with RPM. So the higher you rev it, the more boost, the more, more airflow it makes, so the more power it will make. So let's find out what happens when we apply a, a centrifugal supercharger to an LS application. And you can kind of see there is a definite change in the shape of the power curve. So this was a 5.3 liter. It was an ATK boost ready, low compression short block. Um, it was supplied by the guys at ATK. We installed, and this wasn't one of my motors, this was another guy's motor. Um, we installed Airflow Research 205 heads. It had a good size cam and it. it was a comp blower cam. It was a 614, 624, 227, 243, and a 114 LSA. It also had a Holly High Ram intake, which tends to make power, push power out higher RPM, which again is a good combination with a centrifugal blower. We ran it with the 105 millimeter throttle body, inch and 7 eighths headers, Holly HP management system, and 75 pound injectors. We wanted to make sure we had enough injector to support the kind of power level that we were at. And run in this manner, the NA 5.3 liter produced 466 horsepower. And oddly enough, it produced peak power at 6,400 RPM, which I thought in this case was lower than I expected given that cam timing. We had good heads on it and it had an intake manifold that I thought should have pushed power out farther. Now it was fairly flat past that, but it made peak power lower than I thought. But let's take a look and see what happened when we added a Pro Charger to the mix. This was an F1A94. Um, it, it was uh, pulleyed to produce about, it made about 20 pounds of boost up here at 7,000 RPM. And this pushed the power output past 1,000 horsepower. And it also shifted where we made peak power from 6,400 RPM out to 7,100 RPM, which is kind of typical of a centrifugal blower. As I said, as it revs higher and higher, it adds more and more airflow, it adds more and more boost, and it makes power. So what it does is, as the motor starts becoming inefficient, it says, hey, I'm done making power, I'm at my power peak, I'm getting less efficient now, the supercharger steps in and says, hey, I'm getting more efficient now, so now I'm going to add even more power. So it basically pushes the power peak artificially higher in the RPM range. It kind of takes over when the motor's not more efficient. So it works fairly well, but it, it, this will change where the motor makes peak power. And that's the important part of this particular example of this particular test. Now let's check out what happens when we run a roots blower. The final example I wanted to use in this video is a Roots supercharger, and I did this for two reasons. One, it's interesting because a lot of people think that the Roots supercharger provides immediate boost and that the boost is consistent, and actually what we have here on the Roots supercharger is a rising uh, boost curve. Not, not quite like a centrifugal blower, but it still has a slight rising boost curve. The other thing that happens with a Roots supercharger typically is you also when you upgrade to a root supercharger, you change the intake manifold. Normally on a roots type supercharger, whether it's a Magnuson or in this case, it's the 671 from the guys at um, Speedmaster, you change to a short runner intake. So that in itself has an effect on the power curve irrespective of what's happening with the boost. And then when we combine that with what's happening on the boost curve supplied by the blower, in this case, it's, it's the 671 roots blower with two carburetors on it you also have obviously a change in the power curve. So it's gonna shift where the where the motor wants to make power. This particular test motor was a 383 stroker. It was a 3905 bore with a four inch stroke. It was a 5.3 block. It had Weissco and K1 forged pistons and a, and a Speedmaster crank in it. It had TrickFlow 225 Gen X heads. It had a good crane cam in it. It was 624 lift a 232, 242 degree duration and 112 degree lobe separation angle. And we ran it NA with a fast LSXR intake and inch and seven eighths headers and a, you know, a Holly management system. And run in this manner, the motor produced 548 horsepower, making peak power at 6,300 RPM. And here's what happened when we installed the Speedmaster Roots Supercharger. It had a uh, blower shop blower on it. This was done early on back when they were not trying to do their own blowers. This is when they were actually buying the blowers from the blower shop. So this was the 671. And as you can see, um, kind of like the centrifugal example that we use, the power curve is rising even past 6,500. It's out at even at 6,600, we haven't reached the, the um, power curve yet. This was run at seven pounds, but 
two things happen. As I said, the root supercharger provides a rising boost curve in this example because the blower is sized so that it keeps providing <laughs> more and more airflow at this power level. And also, when you install the supercharger, you have to get rid of the fast manifold. So right off the bat, just changing to a short runner manifold is going to change where this motor wants to make peak power. A shorter runner is going to optimize power production higher in the RPM range or at the very least hurt power down low. So a short runner intake combined with a rising curve from this 671 is going to provide a rising power curve and that's what we see here. We didn't rev it much past 6600 RPM in this example but it would continue to climb so this combination would make peak power higher than it does NA. Obviously we can't have any discussion about boost curves and the change in the shape of the power curve without taking a look at the boost curves and if we take a look at the three we have blue is the turbo boost curve the red is the 671, and the green is the big rising curve offered by the centrifugal blower. And obviously, the size of the blower, the one blower that we use versus the combination, how far we pulley it in the case of the blowers, where we have the boost at in, in terms of the turbo stuff. But if you take a look, generally speaking, we have a fairly flat boost curve from the turbo. On the roots blower, it started out lower, and especially toward the end from 6,000 to 6,500 RPM, had a rising curve. That's actually where the blower is kind of getting <laughs> less efficient. On the centrifugal blower, we started out at a low of 3.7 and rose to over 21 pounds. So as you can see, big rising curve, flat curve with the turbo, and a slight rising curve with the roots blower, plus the change in intake manifold design. That's why each of these combinations has a different effect on the shape of the power curve of the motor you test it all. Now let's get to our conclusion. Okay guys, what do you think about the comparison? Are three different comparisons to try to find out whether or not boost changes the shape of the power curve. Now as we saw in the first one with the turbo, if you supply a consistent amount of boost to any combination, doesn't matter what cylinder head it has, what intake manifold it has, and more importantly, what camshaft it has, whatever the NA curve is, if you supply a consistent amount of boost to that NA curve, you will just make more power, but the shape of the curve will be identical. You'll make peak power at the same RPM, peak torque at the same RPM. Everything will be the same. You will just raise that whole curve upward and make more power. But unfortunately, having a dead consistent boost curve is often difficult. Sometimes it's even difficult with a turbo. If we don't have the turbo sized correctly, maybe it's not as responsive down low. Maybe it's more responsive at, up at the top. Maybe we have difficulty with the wastegate being able to control that. And not just turbo applications. As we saw, a centrifugal blower does not have a consistent boost curve. It has a rising boost curve. It starts out about two or three pounds down low and ends up with 10 or 20 or however you have it pulled at the top. And the problem is that rising curve changes the shape of the NA power curve because the blower gets more efficient with RPM and at some point the motor gets less efficient so the blower takes over and says hey you're not done making power there you're going to make power four or five or six or even a thousand RPM higher and that's what a centrifugal blower does and as we saw with the roots blower combination it was a similar thing as long as the roots blower is sized to provide the power output of the combination you have we had a rising boost curve and not just that we also had when we installed that roots blower we had a change in intake design we had a much short, shorter runner intake manifold which tends to push power output higher in the rpm irrespective of the presence of boost i hope that i didn't confuse everybody boost doesn't change it but how we apply boost does I'm Richard Holder, guys. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, do all that stuff. More and more testing coming up.